This is the Person of Interest podcast, where we meet extraordinary people with a story to tell. Welcome back to the Stockholm School of Economics in the centre of a slightly soggy Riga today uh, for another in our series of podcasts in which we speak to people eminent in their field about their field and try to maybe get a little bit of a crash course in what their area of expertise is. Uh, I'm delighted to welcome another guest into the library here at SSE Riga today. His name is Niels Muizniecks. Welcome, Niels. Hello. Niels is a Latvian-American human rights activist. He's uh, held institutional positions, ministerial positions, uh, was educated at Berkeley and Princeton, uh, formerly a Minister of Social Integration here in Latvia, and most recently uh, was the uh, Council of Europe's Commissioner for Human Rights between 2012 and 2018. Is that accurate enough? That's close enough. Okay, great. And um, I'm assuming that Stockholm School of Economics here is not something with which you're unfamiliar, Niels. I'm quite familiar with the Stockholm School of Economics. I had an office in this in the building next door for several years when I was running a human rights NGO in the late 90s and early 2000s. And w- what exactly was that then? That was the Latvian Center for Human Rights and Ethnic Studies, which is now the Latvian Center for Human Rights. Uh, we uh, did... We were kind of in the 90s. We were the most prominent human rights NGO, doing uh, monitoring of closed institutions. We were doing work on citizenship and language issues, and the perennial issues of integration uh, and tolerance and non-discrimination. Um, and it still exists. No longer has office space here. Uh, that's because Uncle Uncle George uh, had other priorities. I think Mr. Soros. Yes, We're talking exactly. About. Yes. <laughs> we, we, we need to admit that there's a Soros auditorium here as well. So take of that what you will. Um, but early 1990s, then that's immediately after Latvia regained its independence. But you were brought up in the United States. So what was the motivating motivating factor for you to return to Latvia, sort of so promptly, as it were? Hmm. Well, I had several. It wasn't an overnight decision uh, that I will move to Latvia and stay there forever. Um, It was a gradual um, kind of step-by-step process. Um, I was interested professionally in Latvia. I did Soviet studies in graduate school, uh, focused on the national question. I wrote my dissertation on the Baltic independence movements. So I spent a lot of time here in the late 80s as a participant observer of the singing revolutions. And so I spent several months here in 1989, 1990, 1991. Um, So right after, I I gained a lot of friends and and knowledge of the place. And and when I finished my dissertation, I got married. um, And my wife at the time was living in Germany, and I was living in the U.S. Uh, She didn't want to live in the U.S. I didn't want to live in Germany, so Latvia was a good compromise solution. Uh, but I initially came here on a postdoctoral research fellowship to study ethnic relations. Um, and over that year, um, I was offered several interesting jobs, and my wife and I decided to give it a go, and, and we stayed, and we haven't looked back since. And what was your initial, uh, well, speaking of motivation again, your initial motivation for getting into the social sciences, ethnic relations, human rights? Uh, was there perhaps an inspirational teacher or uh, an event which uh, mm. put you on this path? I was interested in, in history, actually. Uh, that was one of my best topics in, in high school. And I always had uh, an interest for what was going on elsewhere in the world, I guess, which was quite unusual for a Southern California a guy. Um, because I had family abroad, my father, sister, uh, lived in France, and I studied in France in high school for a semester, uh, and also in college. Uh, I was almost a French major in college. Uh, <clears throat> but I also grew up in the Latvian emigre or exile community, um, so was kind of inculcated with a sense of mission and, and interest in what was going on in Latvia and behind the, bro- the Iron Curtain more broadly. Um, so I think that, that did it. But, um, and then in, in at university, I had some very good, uh, I had some very good professors, and I decided to to focus on political science, but did a lot of history as well. And was this with a view to affecting change? I mean, was it always an intention of yours to kind of get hands on and move 
to the policy side rather than the academic no, side? No, not at all. My dream was to become a, a professor uh, <laughs> in the United States and to follow an academic career. That's one of the reasons I actually ended up going to graduate school at Berkeley because it was very far away from the policy world. And the ironic thing was after I moved to Latvia, all I did was policy for 25 <laughs> years. Um, so I had an academic interest, but my I had two entry points into human rights. One was kind of intellectual, the other was emotional. Um, the intellectual one was I was trying to understand how the interplay of democratization and ethnic relations, because you had a fragile majority here uh, that, uh, you know, so to, to have a democracy, a functioning democracy, there had to be some kind of coexistence with Russian speakers and you had to get them on board for independence, but also how do you make it work after independence? Um, so that was my intellectual entree and that got me into issues such as minority rights and non-discrimination and, and, and so on. Uh, but my emotional entry point, I remember during my postdoc year here in 1993, encountering Soviet bureaucracy or the remnants or post-Soviet bureaucracy, which was still very Soviet, and thinking, being furious with being treated like dirt, and actually at one point telling a civil, a bureaucrat, it's like, I have rights, you can't do this to me. And they said, they kind of laughed at me, and then I thought, hmm, what are my rights? I got to <laughs> learn how to defend my rights. <laughs> so that's what I did. I began to learn how to defend my rights. Um, and, uh, and, and I've been learning, learning about how to defend my rights and how to help others defend their rights ever since. That's interesting. So that was a very practical uh, example of an everyday situation in which you felt your rights were infringed. Because I imagine for most people, they're walking around, they encounter bureaucracy, whatever, they think this is inconvenient, this is annoying. Mm -hmm. um, but maybe when it's in that sort of post-Soviet level, it takes you up to the next level of actually there's something fundamentally wrong with the system and how it's in, you know, interpreted here. Yeah, well, I think it was also having been born and raised in the United States, having a different understanding of the role of, of a civil service, that they were there for me mm. and not the other way around, um, and that they, they were there to serve me, and they didn't quite see it that way. <laughs> I suppose the obvious question to follow up with is, you know, in the intervening 25 years, have things improved? Have things changed here? Oh, I think very much so. <clears throat> I mean, there's still, there's still pockets, and there's still holdovers, <laughs> and there's still, there's still legacy issues, and there's still some trauma. But when I look at Latvia uh, compared to 46 other countries that I worked in, um, I think Latvia's done pretty well. Um, and I can go into more detail if you like, but uh, <laughs> I've become much less critical of Latvia than I was uh, when I was an NGO person or in academia here. And uh, speaking of the 46 other countries, uh, it was with the Council of Europe that is the 47 uh, member mm -hmm. organization, not to be confused with the European Council. It's, 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 this is it's not a European Union institution. It involves you know, Russia, other, other countries. Exactly. It's based in Strasbourg. Uh, the core is the European Court of Human Rights, and its focus is on, on human rights, democracy, and the rule of law, um, not, not free markets, free movement of people, and not single currency. That's the EU. So this is, this is the poor sister uh, of the EU that is based in Strasbourg. And could you just talk us a little bit through your experience uh, over that four-year period uh, when you were essentially traveling from, as I understand it, traveling from country to country. You would assemble reports, you would deliver reports, sort of verdicts about the situation regarding human rights mm -hmm. in different countries, and I guess await the reaction of your mm -hmm. hosts and of other countries mm -hmm. with vested interests and so on. Well. Uh First of all, it was a six-year mandate, um, so a pretty long mandate by the by the standards of international organizations, um, and non-renewable, which was very good because then you could be independent until the very end. You didn't have to to pull your punches or start lobbying yourself halfway through. Um, the job was impossible, uh, but exhilarating. Uh, it was impossible because the mandate is to deal with human all human rights issues in forty-seven countries. Yeah, and I had a team of twenty-seven people. Who are fantastic, but even with 27 uh, supermen and superwomen, there's no way that you can cover all human rights issues in all countries all the time. Um, so you had to be strategic, you had to make choices, um, and uh, uh, it was a very privileged position because I had access to the top decision makers in a country. 
ministers, prime ministers, presidents, um, but also to any institution or individual that I wanted to meet, any prison, psychiatric institution, migrant detention center, uh, all the nasty places you can imagine where human rights issues are topical, I could get access to them. And countries were obliged to cooperate with me. Um, and all did, uh, with one exception, which was Russia after Crimea. Um, I, they let me go to Crimea after the annexation. I did a, a very tough report, and they were furious with me and refused to cooperate after that. Um, but other than that, I, did, uh, I was able to work in all, all countries on, on all issues. Uh, the way I perceived my role was um, that uh, most human rights issues are resolved at the national level. From the outside, you can give a small push, you can draw attention to issues, you could provide, uh, you could point to good practices and solutions, but in the end, the big struggle takes place at the national level. So I saw my role as providing legal and political ammunition to people on the ground. That could be uh, a minister, parliamentary deputies, uh, an ombudsman, uh, civil servants, NGOs, media. Um, and if I could get a discussion going, and if I could uh, push things in the right direction, uh, then I was doing a good job, in my view. So that's interesting. So you, you were really trying to influence kind of the debate within countries by, you said, giving ammunition. Mm -hmm. But I mean, that suggests that you've had to choose a side, as it were, in, in, who to hand the ammunition to. No, I, my, uh, my ammunition was human rights and legal and political arguments in favor of human rights related reforms. And the standards are clear um, in the European Convention on Human Rights and other conventions. And the fortunate thing is all countries have signed up to these standards. So even if they start talking about traditional values or their mm. cultural specif specificity, I would say, well, listen, you signed up to these, uh, to these standards, and, and uh, here's, what, here's what you have to do uh, to, to fulfill them. Um, so uh, it was very convenient and useful to have the legal standards behind me. Um, but what I would do is I would choose topics where I thought I could have added value. Uh, so they had to be topics that weren't being dealt with by somebody else at the time that were topical, uh, and they could range from issues like children's rights or uh, migration, police violence, uh, the independence of the judiciary, uh, media freedom, uh, women's rights. Uh, and some of these issues were incredibly controversial, mm. uh, dealing with migration or women's sexual and reproductive health and rights or uh, certain minority issues. Um, in Latvia, for example, I dealt with the Istanbul Convention and stateless children, uh, which were pretty hot button. In fact, I remember items. speaking to you about it uh, a few <laughs> yeah, years yeah. ago. Yeah. So you have to be ready to take a lot of hits and, and to tread into very uh, mind-filled territory, um, and you better know your stuff and have your arguments down um, and know how to communicate. And that's what I did in 47 countries. And <clears throat> I, I tried not to make it a one-off thing, so I would try to visit countries several times. I went to all 47 at least once. I went to 40 at least twice. And some countries I went to many times. I went to Ukraine seven times, and I went to Turkey five times. I came to Latvia many times as well to participate in conferences and so on. Uh, but then writing op-eds, writing letters to ministers or parliamentarians uh, to keep the discussion going. Mm. So not, not just a one-time thing, uh, but also to, to use the media a lot. Um, this is, I spent a lot of my time thinking about communication strategies. Because that's, in the end, that's all I had at my disposal is words. Well, this is, gets onto a subject that I really did want to, to speak to you about. You said that a lot of the things that you're discussing are very controversial, very sensitive, um, that a lot of people, I imagine, are going to be on a hair trigger as far as waiting for you to say something controversial, something that they think is wrong, that is contrary to their cultural values, and not least the media as well, who are always looking for the most controversial statement in any mm -hmm. uh, report or so on, which can, can, can give a slightly misleading picture. So how do you negotiate this? Because uh, it strikes me that you're someone who's full of good humor, who smiles quite a lot, uh, and I've seen some of the other human rights rapporteurs, and they're not all like that. So this must have been a, a conscious decision on your <coughs> part to present maybe a more human, a more approachable face, rather than 
this idea that, look, I am the all-powerful rapporteur, I will descend mm. upon you for a, a few weeks and then I will deliver my verdict, which I guess immediately gets people's backs up. Yeah. Well, I think my, I like to, it wasn't a conscious choice, it's just the way I am, is I like to laugh. Um, and sometimes that can get me in trouble mm. because humor doesn't always travel across different cultural contexts. And um, some of the topics I'm dealing with are very, very serious. And if you smile or crack a joke at the wrong time, uh, it's all over. Uh, you will never get their, their ear again. Um, so my humor is a double-edged sword, actually. Mm. But um, I try to... I was told by a number of people that I had several qualities which were unusual for people in that position. One is I was very direct, uh, very upfront. Uh, I didn't. I wasn't very diplomatic in my language, so if I was quite critical of something, I didn't really mince words. And people became grew to expect that from me, um, and uh, and it made life easier. Um, the second thing is I tried to be positive and have positive energy. So uh, one way to do that is to say to a country, "Listen, you can do better than this. What you should be more ambitious." Uh, because you're rich enough, you're democratic enough, and you know you can you can do bet much better than this. Um, so why don't you aim a bit higher? Mm. Um, and here here are some good practices. Why don't you consider these? Why don't you look at this? Um, and you know I don't see the I don't see the problem. Why 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 can't you move forward on this issue? Um, explain it to me. Mm. <laughs> um, and um, that that helped I think. Although at times. Um, I was in very politicized waters, and sometimes you're dealing with a bad faith government uh, that is just going to use your visit, attack you uh, regardless of, of how professional you are for being politicized and unprofessional, um, and then you have to make them pay. Uh, you have to make them pay by raising the political cost of what they're doing, um, and you can do that uh, through communications work. But this must be quite wearing. I mean, there must have been times, surely, when it got you down a bit, where you feel that you're being completely misrepresented, that maybe your professional reputation is being impugned. Uh, how do you cope with that? Well, I've been attacked for many years. Um, in, in, so you develop a, a bit of a thick skin. You become very careful in terms of not making mistakes. Because if you make one factual error or one, uh, then, then they'll, they'll undermine your credibility at, um, in general. Um, so we were quite professional, I think, and didn't make any big mistakes. Some small mistakes, maybe, but I didn't make any big mistakes that people could then tear into me. Um, and in communications, um, you will never have the last word, uh, <laughs> but you have to make sure that if you're misrepresented, you get your point of view out there. Um, and um, I think this is one thing I developed quite a bit is communication strategies within the Council of Europe. I think I was one of the first to use social media and um, uh, we, I kind of upgraded the role of my communications people in, uh, in decision making. I said I, they need to be there at all stages of the process, in the planning, in the execution, uh, in the follow-up, um, and so on, because communication is our primary tool. Another assumption, perhaps, on my part would be that you would quite often encounter obstruction, uh, maybe in various different forms. Um, because you are there to reveal facts which may be embarrassing, which may be you know, counterproductive as far as government policy is concerned mm. or something like that. How do you deal with that, particularly having this sort of affable side? Uh, there's a danger, I would assume, that people might think, well, you know, let's just palm him off with something. He won't dig too deep. Is it a matter of occasionally having to sort of show your other side? that you know, yeah. You yeah, you have to show them that you've done your homework, that yeah. you have gathered all the relevant information. You've talked to the full spectrum of people. Um, and that uh, you're, you're not naive and can't be, uh, can't be manipulated. Um, but most countries were in good faith. Uh, most countries were in good faith. They didn't always agree with the analysis, but they respected it. Uh, one reason that I was allowed, you know, that, that I was treated relatively well is because I think that people saw that I tried really hard to be fair. Countries compare how you treat the same issue across uh, mm. geographically and if you use double standards they will call you on it immediately and I tried really hard to be fair um, and I went to all countries so even to the biggest most powerful the richest uh, countries with the longest democratic tradition I went to those countries and did work and called them out on, on things as well and people appreciate that mm. so I would go to 
uh, Turkey and I'd say, I'm interested in police violence and don't get upset, I just did similar work in Spain. Or I'd go to Russia and say, I'm interested in the independence of the, and efficiency of the judiciary. Uh, and I say, don't worry, I was just in Italy doing similar work. Mm. And they appreciate that because then they don't feel as if they're being in some way stigmatized or, or, or picked out. So that, that was the beauty of this job is you could go it. So this is the level playing field yeah, kind exactly, of uh, exactly. idea. Yeah. And, and the legal standards, it wasn't a political. I'd say, listen, you can disagree with me, but you have a case law in the European Court of Human Rights. Um, and and the, the standards are relatively clear there. You can say what you want to me, but you know, go ahead and try with the European Court of Human Rights, see how far you get. <laughs> An important question, I think, with regard to that job is what difference do you feel you made? I mean, could mm. you give some examples uh, where you feel that your presence did make a palpable difference to people's lives? Yeah, I think that uh, it's pretty rare that you have immediate impact on a situation. But there were a few instances in which we immediately had had some impact. Uh, for example, during Maidan um, in Ukraine, I visited a whole bunch of um, protesters and activists in, in detention. Uh, and they were being targeted by police. Many of them had their heads cracked and their teeth knocked out and so on. Um, and, and afterwards, I saw many of the same activists after they were freed, after the, the regime had changed, and they said, your visit helped us. Uh, not only did it raise our morale, but our conditions of detention improved afterwards because they knew that, that somebody was watching. Um, so I heard that directly from people who had been in, in detention. Um, there were other contexts in which I remember going to the Netherlands, um, looking at issues of migration and child detention. Um, and I remember going to Schiphol Airport in Amsterdam and visiting the detention part of it where mm. uh, migrants without their, without proper documents are held. And I remember seeing a bunch of Syrian children there. And I think, what are children doing in a prison? Particularly uh, in the Netherlands. I mean, it's not somewhere exactly. you, you would assume. So I, I raised this with the minister of, in charge of migration. I said, listen, you wouldn't detain children if they arrived at your land border. Why are you doing this here? These are children. You, know, you should never detain children. Mm. It's traumatic for them and so on and so forth. So right after my visit, he announced that they would no longer do this. Um, there was another, um, another case in, in Cyprus where together with the ombudsman, uh, we intervened on a case where a mother with a baby, uh, she was a migrant, uh, was detained and her child was taken away from her. And we said, this is inhumane. Um, it doesn't matter what her migration status is. You cannot take her child away from her. Uh, and they were quite upset, but they released a mother and she was reunited with her. Uh, with her child. So sometimes on these individual cases, you can make a difference. But most of the time, it takes persistence and a long time in raising the issue again and again and again. Mm. I remember going to Ireland early in my, in my mandate, um, and they were in the midst of a juvenile justice reform. They had awful juvenile justice institutions. And I remember asking, well, how did this come about? Tell me about, tell me about the process whereby politically people decided to change this. And they said, well, your predecessor raised this with us over a period of six years, and we just got tired of it. <laughs> <laughs> or, uh, you know, now this issue of stateless children. I've been raising this issue in Latvia for 21, 22 years. Okay, finally, it's being addressed. Uh, but you have to be persistent. Some of these things won't change overnight. And I'm not saying that it's because of me, uh, you know, but I, I, I engaged on this issue and provided the legal and political argumentation to people uh, over a longer period of time. Um, the toughest thing was trying to inject a human rights component into the migration discussion uh, because people were just freaking out when, um, in 2015, 2016. Um, but to try to remind governments of their human rights obligations, to think about the long term. Um, same thing with uh, terrorist attacks and human rights. Uh, because all over Europe in 2015, 2016, uh, you had a spate of terrorist attacks and really awful government responses where politicians felt pressured to act as if they had things under control, to, mm. to adopt bad laws very quickly, uh, and then to, uh, to sue the population and say, we've got it under but control. this is sort of laws which could spill over into yes, other areas. Exactly. Yeah. For example, laws giving, um, giving vast powers uh, uh, to security services to do surveillance, mm. um, uh, vast powers to police who, who would then engage in, in uh, ethnic profiling. Um, and so what I did in that 
context, I would say, listen, I understand you. It's a the security situation is dire. You have to give your security services more, uh, more powers and more resources. Uh, but one core thing is uh, strengthen democratic oversight of your security service at the same time. If you don't do that, uh, you're going to make huge mistakes and you'll pay for it and you'll play into the hands of the terrorists. Mm -hmm. So this is a way I could even have a, begin to have a discussion with the security services and politicians about how to maintain human rights in the context of counterterrorism. Um, so I had a lot of tough discussions like this uh, in, in, in different uh, contexts. Ministers of Interior are not easy guys. Uh, they don't laugh at your jokes. Uh, <laughs> they usually have a whole bunch of people with uniforms sitting across the table from you, uh, and you have to find a way, an entry point, uh, to get them to even listen to you. Isn't that an instance in which maybe, maybe acting at the supranational level is more effective than acting at the individual nation state level. Um, yes, I mean, there were countries where I could say, listen, look at this country. They slowed down, they didn't adopt this law, or they have a very good system of democratic oversight of their security service. You should look at this model. Mm. Um, and I remember talking with the head of uh, counterintelligence in uh, the Netherlands and asking, they have a very intrusive oversight system where um, parliamentary deputies can go in and they can talk to anybody in the security services and they get access to any file. And they can go to any facility and say, we want to see what's going on here. And, and I, I asked, these, I asked them, well, how do you sell this to your mm. colleagues, uh, uh, you know, to other spies across, uh, across, uh, across Europe? And he said, well, there are two things. Um, one thing is we need more money. And nobody trusts us, but everybody trusts our overseers. So we say, ask them, mm -hmm. you know, are we doing a good job? Are we obeying the rule of law? And so on and so forth. So uh, they're good for us uh, because they... they you know they're credible and they they can say that we're we're and the other thing is um we got into a war and here he was talking about the iraq war <clears throat> based on politicized intelligence and we don't want to make that mistake again um so i found that very interesting to talk to intelligence people uh mm. about what kind of arguments have some kind of traction with your colleagues you know when they're in these situations they need resources they want powers they're facing a lot of political pressure and, and so on so and they saw those as outweighing you know maybe the the instinctive reaction is let's keep as much secret as we possibly yeah, can yeah exactly yeah it's it's, it's a bit counterintuitive mm. so uh but it was very interesting for me to use these kinds of arguments in, in other contexts and what sort of issues do you see coming up because that's something which you know, uh, was connected to the migration crisis, connected to these terrorist attacks and so on, which rose to huge, huge prominence within a relatively short period of mm. time. It has sunk away a little bit, but I get the sense it's probably going to be something which comes back again and again. So, Well, terrorism and migration are not going anywhere. Mm. Um, they're going to be here, and, and the migration system is it's broken in, in Europe, it doesn't really work, and there's no solidarity, and it's basically a beggar thy neighbor uh, uh, approach. And that issue is not going to go anywhere. Um, it's only going to get more complicated and challenging because of climate change. Uh, and you'll have a lot of climate migrants um, moving moving in the future. So that will be a huge issue. Do you think that, that you know, right to water, right to, um, you know, shelter is going to become more of a human rights issue? Well, the water, you're, you're already having com conflicts over, over water um, and... In, within the UN context, the right to water and uh, many of these social and economic rights um, are recognized, at, at European level less so. Uh, they might be rec recognized uh, in declarations, but not as ju mm. justiciable rights um, very often. Um, but the whole issue of climate change will be a huge one and how that affects equality, because every, people are going to be affected differentially. Indigenous people in Scandinavia or northern Russia are going to be hit really hard by climate change. Um, I'm sure other uh, specific groups will be hit harder than, uh, you know, than, than the mainstream. Um, it'll affect the right to life, the right to health. Um, uh, it'll affect a lot of rights, uh, and it'll affect migration. So this is going to be a huge issue. Um, and access to information, documentation, and the lobbies, uh, access to information about who is lobbying the EU and member states to not uh, do more on climate change. I think that will be a huge issue as well. Um, another issue is artificial intelligence. 
basically machines making decisions um, very often with the same biases that humans have, but with potentially very grave consequences. Mm. How do we how do we keep that under control? How do we protect data and make sure that non-discrimination is maintained in a context where people can say, well, I didn't make that decision. It was meant, made by this commute, computer. But do you think there's a danger that uh, that's developing so rapidly that the sort of long-term repeated uh, visits and uh, human interaction that you've been talking about for the last number of years gets kind of left behind and that we're in a situation where the AI has been rolled out and we're still not quite sure what we're supposed to do with it or whether it's allowed to do this to us. Well, it's it's a tough issue because it, it one, it requires human rights people to up their game mm-hmm. about technology. Um, and second of all, it forces human rights people to change the way they function. Um, until now, human rights people have dealt primarily with governments. Uh, but you have, uh, if you're not talking with the big tech firms on AI, you're missing the game. Um, so you have some, for example, there's UN special rapporteurs who are now doing visits to companies instead of to countries. But do they have the right to do visits to companies? Not necessarily. Companies? But this is, this is where what works with a, a company. How do you convince a country? a company that it's in its best interest to have good human rights practices. Uh, One way is to say, listen, this is an issue of risk management. If you don't uh, make sure that you're not violating human rights, this can hold huge risks for your company, reputational risks and other risks. You see what happens to some countries when it turns out, oh, their products are being made by slave labor somewhere, Mm -hmm. by child labor. Um, They're boycotts there, uh, and it destroys their reputation. So part of it is risk management, um, but part of it is also government's responsibilities to make sure that everybody in their jurisdiction um, is, uh, you know, fulfilling their human rights obligations, and companies have human rights obligations as well. Your mandate at the Council of Europe ended last year, so what's on the menu now? <laughs> well, what I did immediately after uh, I, I walked 800 kilometers, I did the Camino de Santiago de Compostela with my wife, which was great because there nobody cares about your opinion, <laughs> nobody cares about your profession, you're just a walker. All they care about is where you started walking, how far you're walking to, where you're staying at night, uh, are you religious, uh, uh, why are you doing this? Uh, so that was, that was great. Uh, now right now I'm, I'm doing a, a bit of consulting work for the, for the UN, for the Council of Europe, for others, and I'm applying, I'm a candidate to be um, EU Ombudsman, uh, which is a, a position within the European Union uh, examining complaints about maladministration and fundamental rights uh, involving EU institutions and EU agencies. And when will you know if you've got that job or not? Mid-December is a vote in the European Parliament, um, so that is when I will know uh, whether I will be doing that for the next five years or, or something else. Well, thank you very much for joining me at SSE Riga today, Neil, and good luck. Thank you. Thank you for listening. This podcast was produced by SSC Riga. If you'd like to learn more about the topic, visit the open course schedule at SSC Riga Executive Education. For more podcasts, find us on Spotify, iTunes, or the platform of your choice. Remember, share this episode with your friends and colleagues.